Bless God. Thanks. You may be seated. Uh, the sermons uh, from today's uh, pastor's conference are available on video uh, in line to watch, and also the audio is available to download and to make copies. And you'll get that at uh, TSC, as in Times Square Church, NYC, as in New York City. That's tscnyc.org. And you can get uh, all of the materials from the, that were spoken today. Uh, tonight and tomorrow night, we're going to be here, the um, main service at 7 p.m. <clears throat> Friday night is a youth night from 10 to 11.30. And I really do believe that's why the Lord has brought these messages, uh, this message today on the lambs. Uh, coming in because there, high, there are high schools coming. I, as I understand it, I'm, I may not have all the details, but as I understand it, there's a lot of kids coming that are not Christian kids. They're not from uh, the local churches. There's going to be quite a few in this Friday night service. And that's why the Lord is speaking to us to be ready to feed the lambs. So many are going to be coming to the kingdom of God. Saturday 10 to 1 right here in this room is a women's conference. Pastor Teresa will be the only speaker at that. And uh, you've heard her today, so get, ladies, get, get on the phone, get your friends out. And uh, there's going to be a, an incredible conference. And that's uh, Saturday from 10 to 1 right here. Now, in Port Glasgow, <clears throat> at the town hall, Saturday and Sunday night at 7 p.m., the local churches are going to be, we, we fade out. Times Square Church is the beginning of our fade out and heading back to New York City. But the local churches are going to continue uh, these evening meetings, at least for these two nights. And... You'll have to stay tuned for events in the future, but that would be in the Port Glasgow Town Hall, 7 p.m., Saturday night, Sunday night. Local churches, local testimonies, uh, worship led by musicians from local churches, and the Times Square Church Choir will also be there on Saturday night. And uh, so it's, it's our privilege to have just walked beside you for this short moment of time. And as I said on the first night, it's like a, a relay race. We've come around the bend, we've got the baton, we run together for... Just a few days and we hand it off and away you go. And uh, we're just believing God that there's going to be a reports of an incredible harvest. I, I just know it in my heart. And uh, God has been speaking of the harvest. He's been preparing the pastors in the surrounding areas to, to be able to uh, embrace these young ones that are going to be coming in and to, to be willing to feed them. Uh, he's talking to you about unity in the body. of, of uh, there, is, there, are no, there are no lone rangers in the true church of Jesus Christ. We are one body in Christ, and you and I have got to be able to appreciate that and learn that and walk in that. And uh, now, this afternoon, the last session is, uh, was such a, a profound change in my heart came through this understanding of covenant. Now, personally speaking, I was a, a very, I was a Christian driver. There's no other way to describe it. I was a revivalist in the church in Canada, and I was expert at coming into congregations, condemning the whole lot, and bringing everybody to their knees, weeping, and then we said, oh, what a move of God that was. But there was a problem with it, you see, because I'd go back the next year, it'd be the same people, same tears, same spot, same knees, I'd go back the next year, and it just seemed that there was this constant sense of failure and so little sense of victory. I remember falling into such a sense of uh, hopelessness about it, I came home from one of these crusades and I said to my wife, Teresa, I said, the Christ I preach is deficient. I must not have a hold of the whole truth because surely there's victory in Jesus. I mean, we can't just be getting together and preaching to saints like they're sinners and condemning the church. And then just finally, you know, even the most zealous, and I was very zealous. I was, I was naturally strong at that time. I, I worked out, when I was a cop, I worked out three hours a day. I ran two, three, four uh, five miles, I don't know. I, I was an avid runner. I was physically strong. And I would get people at the altar saying, I can't do this, I can't do this. And I remember I'd, I'd look them in the face and say, well, if I, if I can, you can. We all can. And um, so send them out to defeat. Uh, I, I, I traveled a long way down this road with a lot of natural strength until at the age of 37, I had a very serious physical breakdown. Happened suddenly in Western Canada during, during an actual conference. I would, I, was, I would fast, I would run, I would work out, I would preach every night like the, the place was on fire. And uh, the, uh, then suddenly this strange feeling came over me and I, I didn't know what it was. Uh, and I, I came back home. Uh, I was a, still a hockey player at this time. When I was 37. I played on a, a community hockey team. And I remember going out to play in a game and I, I couldn't breathe. 
got off a, a shift on the ice and I came back and sat on the bench and I, I was just heaving for breath. I could not breathe. I had a pounding headache. And I went out and played the second shift and came back and it was worse than the first. And I thought something is really wrong. I didn't know that I had physically come to the end. It's so hard when you've been trusting in yourself. And suddenly I needed the grace that I was not affording to others around me. And through this experience, I came to the understanding of the new covenant. Now, I had the practical experience when I came to New York in 1994 of having been broken, in a sense, and having needed the grace of God to carry on. And uh, so I, I, I preached that way, although theologically I didn't fully understand it. But I knew it was real because I had lived through it. I knew I had needed grace. I knew I had come short of, of what I had preached to everybody else that they need to be. I knew my own strength was gone and I needed another strength to replace it. And I had the practical experience. David Wilkerson had the theological background. And all his life he'd had a promise that God had given him that he would show him his covenant before he died. He would give him an, a, a clear understanding of grace. What is the difference between the Old Testament and the New? Why is the, the New Testament good news? Why the cross? How is that victory appropriated? What happened on the cross? What kind of, a, what kind of an arrangement was it between God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the church? How, did, how does it all fit together? And, and why was it good news to a people who were already zealous for what they thought was God and his way of living and his law? And he wrote a book out of the experience that we kind of traveled this road together, learned together, and he wrote a book called The New Covenant Unveiled. I think be more profound than the cross and the switchblade in the long term. If those who have read it, anybody here read The New Covenant Unveiled, then you understand it's just, it's so simple it's profound, I don't know. There's nothing new in it. There's nothing new. It's just put in a way that you and I can understand it again. If we're not careful, we can actually lose grace. And we become drivers of the flock instead of feeders of the sheep. Pastor Neil Rhodes has been a faithful associate pastor at Times Square Church for 12 years now. Came to us initially with his wife, Nolene, conducting a, a marriage seminar. And it was there that the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart that he was to come and help us. He's been on pastoral staff and his wife nolene has been part of our staff for 12 years now and been a great faithful friend and a blessing to the church. And he's going to come and share with us a synopsis. He's got a very real dilemma on his hands today. How do you put five years of study, how do you, how do you put an entire book into 45 minutes or so? And um, well, he's going to give it his best try. How's that? All right. Pastor Neil, God bless you. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Carter. It's been one of the greatest joys of our lives. In fact, um, I believe that it's this coming to, uh, to work with Pastor Carter, Pastor Teresa, and the other team has been just an amazing, amazing gift from heaven for us. And um, I just thank God for these years, uh, how God has completely changed my life. Uh, we are not the same people as when we came. And uh, the word that they share, uh, you'll probably hear lots of phrases, lots of thoughts, but because we, uh, we walk together and you probably think I sound a little like Pastor Carter, but that's okay. It's been a great time and a word that has just filtered into our hearts and lives, and we have been changed. The New Covenant, when I first came to Times Square, I went, we went to Bible college, <clears throat> and uh, I felt that I was pretty astute when it came to uh, doctrines, and I uh, understood, you know, I, I majored, I got my bachelor's degree in theology and ministry, and so I kind of felt like we had a reasonable handle on doctrines until I came to Times Square Church. And uh, I remember Pastor Carter preaching and Pastor David preaching these messages on the New Covenant. And I would go home and I'd say to Nolene, I think they're schizophrenic. Uh, you know, there are times that it's this incredible grace. And I'd, I remember walking down the, the road one day the, on the sidewalk and I said to him, uh, are you eternal security? And he just laughed, and he'd say, God will show you. And I said, well, what's happening here? I don't understand. It took a whole year 
for this truth, simple truth, to sell into my heart on the new covenant. It took a whole year. And I can remember the day sitting in that morning service uh, and suddenly understanding what these people had been preaching for a whole year and it was just going by me. It suddenly caught a hold and ever since then it has completely changed my life. Father, I thank you that this word is already mentioned. It, it's not new. It's been around since the beginning, the, the early church fathers, the Puritans. And Lord, we thank that you have graced us enough to bring it to our attention again. I ask that you give the spirit of revelation today. We are just your servants, but you take your word and you bring revelation to the heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So as we, as I just open this up just in a small sense for you today, let me just begin by, by saying that when we came on staff, we, we picked up a lot of the counseling, and there was one case in particular that I remember so well. My secretary called in and said, there's a lady on the phone, and um, her and her daughter haven't been speaking for um, a long time, and they asked, could they come in and... and get some counseling so uh, they can begin to work through the problems. And so I said, I said, I haven't been speaking for like nine years. They come to the same church, live in the same house, drive in the same car, and they haven't been speaking to each other for nine years. I said, bring them in. It's going to take me five minutes and we'll have them talking already. And so she set the appointment. They came in. And when they sat down and began to share... Uh, it was an amazing story. So I said to the daughter, why don't you tell me your side of the story? And so they were in, as they began to share, she said, my mother and father would always argue and fight. And there was this fight going on in this particular day. And it moved from the living room in one of the apartments in New York. And it moved from the living room. And I was just a little girl, eight, nine years of age. And I was watching my mom and my dad fight and they were yelling and screaming. My mother walked from the living room into the kitchen and she was doing something on the table, you know, maybe trying to wash pans or dishes. I forget exactly what she said. And she was working. So I followed them there and I was crying. The little girl says I was crying and crying as my mother and father got into this incredible argument. And uh, they were screaming, and my father started pushing, because I'd seen him shove and, and, and hit my mother before. And so he, he started this. He started pushing and shoving, and, and uh, as, as he pushed my mom this, on this one occasion in the kitchen, I, I stood there, and I was crying and yelling, stop, stop, stop the fighting. And, uh, but as he pushed her, the mom had picked up a knife, a carving knife, and had turned around, and as he came to push her, she stuck him with this knife. And you, you've got to understand the, the glibness of me saying, yeah, bring him in, I'll, five minutes I'm going to have them talking again, to suddenly realizing that this is a deep problem that I have no answer for. The father fell to the ground with this carving knife stuck in his heart. This little girl saw her, her dad's blood just spill to the ground. By the time the paramedics were called and got there, he was dead. And so she closed down. She clamped up. And for something like eight, nine years, uh, there was, she was like 16, 17 years of age when she came to see us. She had just shut down. And so her mother and her would walk you know, together. They'd come in the car. They'd come to Times Square Church. But never would they speak. What do you do? How do you answer this kind of a problem? I'm sitting there and uh, I'm saying, that you, you can't give them a five-step program to get them out of this problem, folks. These are some of the issues that you deal with. There's, there's got to be an answer. And, uh, and by the time I get to the end this afternoon, I'll give you what I gave to them and as an answer, as they broke through and came into uh, an incredible release and began speaking one time again to each other. You know, when Peter was standing 
at the fire warming himself and he's denying Christ. He denies him once, he denies him a second time. And the third time that Peter is at this fire warming himself and uh, they say, aren't you part of this group? Aren't you part of these, these people and, uh, that followed him? And Peter's remark in Luke chapter 22, he says, I don't know him. Now, on the, on, the front, on the front of that, we can say Peter is just making a denial. But, but I heard Pastor Carter talk about this, and this is what stirred me to open up this afternoon with this concept. You see, Peter was speaking a truth. The Jesus that was going to be beaten, the Jesus who was going to be crucified, the Jesus who seemingly was giving up all this without a fight. I don't know this man. I don't know this person who's going to a cross. I don't know this person. The person that Peter wanted to know and wanted to understand is the, the Jesus who was going to dispose the Roman occupiers, who was going to sit on a, on a throne and rule. He said, that's the Jesus I know, the one that healed and cast out demons and, and then was going to move on to become this king on a throne. He, that's the Jesus he wanted to know. And in a real truth, many of us want that same kind of a Jesus. We want the one that's going to empower us and the one that's going to give us that rulership and we're going to rule and reign with him. And so we see much of the body of Christ moving to find that kind of a Jesus. But this kind of a Jesus who's going to a cross, this kind of a Jesus who is moving according to the will of God to go through suffering, to go through the pain, and then finally to go to that cross and be crucified. I don't know this Jesus. Now you contrast that after the resurrection with the apostle Paul in the book of Philippians who says, I'm willing to forsake everything that I may know that Jesus. See, he got a revelation. Paul had this amazing revelation. This is the Jesus I want to know. I want to know this Jesus who was willing to go to the cross. I want to know him. I want to know why he went to the cross. I want to understand this thing of the cross. I want to understand this Jesus. And see, when Paul, Paul had seen something and he was willing to let everything go, he was willing to, to lay down everything. He says, the loss of all things, reputation, power, education, everything that was gained to him. He says, I count but loss that I might know him. Folks, that's today what I want to share with you. If it's in your heart to know that kind of a Jesus. What did he do, as Pastor Carter mentioned, at the cross? What did he do for us? What was the cross all about? And I don't want to you know, sound so elementary and uh, insult you by just thinking it's just basics. But as Pastor Carter mentioned, there is a truth that the Puritans have taught and others have taught. It's not new but maybe has been lost for some time. Let me open this to you. We must begin in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a do gospel. This is, the Old Testament was a do gospel. God gave 10 commands and said, if you do them, I will be God to you. The whole desire of God was, I want to be God to you. I want to deliver you. I want to be... I want to be to you as you believe God should be. Now I'm going to give you 10 commands. You keep them. But the Apostle Paul said, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in that which is written in the book of the law to do them. We have a problem. After the fall, God says, I'll, I'll be God to you, but I'm going to, give you, I'm going to just give you some simple words. Keep them, and I'll be with you. If you break one, you've broken them all. And so the law was given to man through a series of different Old Testament covenants. God was revealing himself, but he said, I'm going to give you this word. If you keep it, you keep it, I'll be God to you. The problem is nobody can. Nobody can keep these commands. You've got to continue in them in which to live. So nobody can do them. Man has fallen. There's an inability for us to keep and to maintain the laws of God. So we can go all through the scriptures. Man cannot know God now in his own efforts. 
1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man cannot receive the things of God. Man cannot believe God through his own effort. John 6.44, no man can come to me unless the Father draw him. No man can obey God. Because the Bible says in Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity towards God. Man cannot think thoughts about God because in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, it's not sufficient of ourselves to think these things. And God, man cannot speak of the things of God. Matthew 12, 34, you, he calls them a generation of vipers. How being evil can you speak good things? Man cannot do anything righteous. Jesus said in, in uh, John 15, verse 5, without me ye can do nothing. And so the law was given to us to show our inability. How many have kept the law faultlessly all their days? Let me see your hand. See, the Bible shows us that we are lawbreakers. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It was Job who said this. He saw something, and this was his cry. Job 16, verse 21. Oh, that there might be one who could plead for man with God. There was a cry in his heart where he said, Is there somebody, is there one who can plead for man before God? Is there one who could stand before God and plead for us as a man pleads for his friend? That was the cry of Job. The answer comes in the book of Isaiah. When God begins to reveal this incredible plan through the prophet. In Isaiah 49 verse 8, the father says to the son, there needs to be, the cry is, can there be somebody? Well, as far as man is concerned, nobody can. You know, I like to illustrate it like this. It's like, it's like a jug of water. Here we've got this, this bottle of water. God is righteous. He's holy. He's pure. And then if you took another one and it was full of dirt, full of mud, that represents man. And it's like God saying, I've got this holy, righteous law, this word. I want you to keep it. But how can we when we are polluted like a, a jug full of mud? No matter how you try, the moment you embrace something, it's, it's going to be polluted immediately because there's no good thing that dwells within us. But this is what God said. He said to his son, he said, I'm going to send you because you're, going to, you're pure and you're holy and you're righteous. I'm going to send you and you are going to be the covenant. There is one that is going to plead for man and it's going to be the son of God. And so God says, I'm going to send you as the covenant in Isaiah 49 verse 8. But turn with me to Isaiah 42, which is probably my most favorite scripture on the basics. Now, I could have shared with you from, from the life of David and the life of Joseph and from Abraham. But I felt like I just needed to stay with the absolute basics for, for you today. Now, this psalm, this uh, Isaiah 42 it's like Isaiah gets this glimpse into heaven of this conversation taking place between the Father and the Son. He's like the third party, and, and the, the, the heavens are opened up just for this brief moment. And when you read Isaiah 42, you begin to see this conversation that is taking place between the Father and between the Son. And it begins in chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect. And we know as you read through all of this, He's talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 3, a bruised reed, he shall not break. Smoking flax, he shall not quench. This is talking about Christ. He won't be discouraged. In verse 4, verse 5, and uh, thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens and stretched them out. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and the spirit to them that walk therein. Now look at verse 6. I, the Lord... And this is now the father speaking to the son. And he says, son, you are going to go down. And this covenant, I've made covenant with these people. And they've broken it again and again and again. Throughout the Old Testament, you see, I made covenant with them. They broke it. They broke it. They can't keep these things. 
that I give them. They need somebody who can go down and keep this covenant with me. There needs to be somebody. And so, son, I am sending you. Now, to have a covenant, it's got to be two parties have to agree to the terms. So there are terms to this covenant, and both of these parties have to agree to it. So the father says, these are my terms. You go, son. You're going to be born of a, of a virgin. You're going to live among the people. I'm going to give you a calling. So verse 6, here it says, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness. So it's not going to be by lineage. It's not going to be a choosing of lineage. It's going to be a calling that I'm going to give you. You're going to go because I've called you to go. And you're going to go down to, this, to the earth. You're going to be born of a virgin. And you're going to grow up. And the, the father goes on and he says, and I'll be a father to you. In fact, when he calls him in righteousness, John 5 verse 30 says, I can do, Jesus says, I can do nothing of myself as I hear I judge. And then he goes on to say, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father. So part of the covenant was that the Father was saying to the Son, you go down, but it's not going to be about your will. You're not even going to be able to speak your own words. You're not even going to pass your own judgments. You're going to do everything that I ask you to do you are going to do it flawlessly. You are going to keep these things. Everything that I ask you to do, you will do it. So Jesus says, I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father. The Father says to him, I'll hold your hand. In fact, John eight twenty nine says, He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. And so the promise of God was, Son, you go. You are pure, you are righteous, you can keep my law, you can keep everything that I ask you to do, you can keep it faultlessly. And this is my promise to you. I'm going to give you a calling. So you will know that this is, you have been sent by me for this express purpose. But this is what I will do. I will hold your hand through the whole process. You will know that I am with you every step of the way. I will be with you. You'll never be alone in this. I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to keep you, says the third part. He says, and I will hold your hand and keep thee. And, he's, and that word keep there means that nobody can take your life. Jesus comes and says, no one takes my life from me. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take up this command I receive from my Father. And so God is giving him this incredible promise and saying, if you go down, if you go down and be this covenant, these are my promises to you. I'll be with you. I'm going to give you a calling so you will know that you've been sent from me. I'll hold your hand through everything. So wherever you go, it doesn't matter what they say, how they come against you, they're going to have to fight against me because I'm holding your hand like a daddy. I'm going to be holding your hand through all of this. And then he says, and I will, I will keep you. In other words, I'll protect you. I'll fight for you. They won't be able to take your life. But then he comes down and he says, and give thee for a covenant. Now the give there means I'm going to give you as a sacrifice. That the sins of the world are going to be placed upon you. There's going to be a moment in history when you're on that cross. You're going to have to die, son. I'll be with you all the way through. I'll keep you, protect you, I'll, I'll stand with you. But there's coming to this point where you are going to have to die. Because I'm going to give you as a covenant. And you're going to have to trust that when I place, allow the sins of the world to be placed upon you, and there's going to be that momentary separation, and you die, you're going to have to trust that I, as part of the covenant that I'm making with you this day, I will raise you up. I will raise you out of the grave. On the third day, I will raise you up out of the grave. You're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to believe this. And so the son is looking at the father. This conversation is going on in heaven. The father is speaking to the son. We've made covenant with man over these generations, none of them can keep them. We can't use them right now. They can't do this. So I'm selecting you. I want you to go. So the son says, okay, I will do that. But there is a part of the covenant that I want to make 
So a covenant has two parties, and both have to agree to the covenant of both parties. Turn with me to John chapter 17. So the father lays down the terms. You're going to have to die. The son comes back and says to him, and if you read John chapter 17, John chapter 17, we call it the high priestly prayer. It's really Jesus is speaking back to the Father. He's communicating back to the Father. It's actually, this is where for the very first time in all of scriptures, he's going to use the word, my will. This is, I, I will something. So in John chapter 17, you, you, this is the response of Christ as he's revealing it to us of what he has agreed to with the Father. Now this is his response back to the Father. Number one, he says, both in verse one and verse five, he says, the glory which I had with you, I, I want you to restore that glory back. So if I go and I die upon that cross, I want you to receive me back into glory. I wanna have that glory again that I had with you in the beginning. I wanna be fully restored back into that place. This is part of my covenant. With you, Father. I, I'll do what you ask, but these are the things that I am asking. And then number two, he says in verse 24, he says, Father, I will. Here is now Jesus Christ exercising for the first time. Remember, we read the scripture, it says, I haven't come to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. But here Jesus, for the first time, is saying, this is my will, Father, this is what I want as part of the covenant that you and I will make together. I will that they be with me where I am. Now, folks, this is an amazing, this is an amazing concept. What Jesus is saying to the Father, he's saying, the Father could be stepped back and says, nothing unholy has come into my presence. Are you asking me that that this is your will, that you want these ungodly, unholy these miserable people who have failed day in and day out, who, who cannot do anything I ask them, are you asking that they be with you where you are? And Jesus says, this is part of the covenant I'm making, that everybody who believes in me should have immediate access to you. You mean these miserable people? These sinners, these, these ugly things, you, you want them immediate access to a holy God. He says, that's part of my covenant with you. I'll go, I'll do everything you want. But part of the covenant I want from you, Holy Father, is that anybody, whether male, female, young, old, it doesn't matter. There's, there's neither male nor female, Jew or Gentile in Christ. I want anybody and everybody, young or old, if they call upon me and receive me as Savior, I want them immediate access into your presence. That's part of the covenant that you and I will be making. You can imagine God saying, what are you, look, I'm asking you just to go die. You're asking to bring these people into my presence. And then he goes on further and he says, you know something else, Father, this is what I ask, that you protect them. Look at verse 11. He goes on as saying, he says, now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. The same way you keep me, the same way you, your hand is on me and held my hand and protected me from all evil and from all wrong, I want you to give that to every single one of them, no matter who they are, where they come from. I want them to be able to walk boldly in this world, not in their own strength, not in their own ingenuity, but just with the knowledge that their hand is also in the hand of an eternal Father who's guarding them, protecting them. Folks, with this kind of a knowledge, you can go anywhere in the world and God will be with you. You can go anywhere into the world. It doesn't matter how dark it is. God will go with you. It doesn't matter if it's in the heart of a Muslim country. You will go there and God will be with you, holding your hand, keeping you, protecting you from all harm. Hallelujah. This is what God says. This is what Jesus is asking. He says, I want that same glory and I'm going to give it to them. I want you, to, you put me back in this. Wherever I am, he says, I want them to be with me. Oh, God. 
you know how hard I've prayed? Do you know how many times I was, in 1975, we had this, this new teaching was coming in. Early morning prayer. Everybody came to the church at five o'clock. And we had to pray for an hour at the church. And we were serious about God. And we got into this. And I condemned anybody who didn't come at five o'clock. I just had that way of saying, oh, hi, how are you? You weren't there today? <laughs> Fraser, where were you? <laughs> and, and we were just bent on being able to know God and, and serve him in such a capacity that we would, we would have his revival when all the while it's already been guaranteed to us. It's already been given to us. It's already been handed over to us. And this is part of this covenant that Jesus was going to his father and saying, this is my part. So, so the father says, this is what I want you to do. And the son's coming back and saying, all right, then this is what I want you to do. And they agree. Oh, beloved, the Father and the Son agree. So when Jesus comes down to the earth that day and he walks, he knows. That's why he is so steadfast. He knows where he's going. He's, his chin is set like flint. He is unmoving because he knows the greater joy. He knows what his God has given to him. He knows he's walking out this covenant agreement with the Father. That's why he doesn't speak anything out of himself. He's not doing anything out of his own strength. He is just let, following what the the Father is saying, moving ever more closer to this cross. Peter says, I don't know that man. Paul says, I want to know this. Because he saw in this that there was revelation that's setting people free. And so Paul says, this is the man I want to know. And so he goes to that cross. And on the cross, the greatest, if you ask me what are the greatest words in the New Testament, it has to be unequivocally, it has to be. The words when Jesus, that John records on the cross, when he's on that cross, he says, it is finished. <laughs> it's finished. What was finished? The work that you had sent me to do. He wasn't talking to us. He wasn't saying, guys, it's finished. You're going to be forgiven. And you maybe if you keep good, you'll be able to maybe get there. But he wasn't speaking to us. He was declaring to the Father, Father, everything you've asked me to do, I have finished the work. It means to be so perfected. It means to be so utterly complete. You look it up, telio. It means to be so utterly perfect and completely done that there can be nothing more added to what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And he said, Father, this agreement between you and me, while everybody is gazing on, everybody is looking on, the world is in its, all of its ugliness is just looking on. But the Father and the Son complete that agreement. Father, my side is finished. Three days later, the side of the Father is completed and he raises him from the grave and that covenant is now sealed. It's no rust can corrode it. No thief can steal from it. It is in heaven and the Holy Spirit is now making it real to the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It gives access to any sinner. The lame man. I love Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is, is one of those characters that I love so much. David made a covenant with Jonathan. This is the types, the Old Testament type. David made a covenant with Jonathan. It's like father and son covenant. Jonathan dies. And then years later, literally years later, when David is now seated as king in his own kingdom, rest from all of his enemies. He's in Jerusalem and he remembers, ah, I made a covenant with Jonathan to do good to his family all of his days. Is there anybody in this kingdom that is a relative of Jonathan? And he says, yes, there is a person and his name is Mephibosheth. Now listen to me, folks. Listen to this. Mephibosheth, he lost his right as a prince 
when his father was killed. Jonathan would have been the next king if it followed from Saul to Jonathan. It, then Mephibosheth would have been a prince. When David became king, we see that he lost his right as a prince. Man lost his right when he sinned in the garden. Mephibosheth was banished to the desert of Lodabar. Man has been banished from the garden. He was lame from infancy. Man has been paralyzed by original sin. We don't know, we, there's no way we can come back to God in our own strength. Paralyzed by original sin. But Mephibosheth is invited by David to sit at the king's table. And beloved, because of the covenant between the father and the son, the invitation has gone out that there is a, a place at the table of God that you and I can come and sit and we can begin to feast again in the word of God. We can begin to sit at the table of the Lord and he can, there's no good days, bad days any longer. There's no, no, you can make it and know that there's no, I can do man. God says, I invite you to come to my table and to begin to feast. David regarded Mephibosheth based on covenant. Man is regarded by God because of the covenant made between him and his son. When Mephibosheth, he is spared by the Gibeonites when they were put to death because of Saul's sin. Man is spared by death because of another, Jesus Christ. We are spared. Because of this covenant that was made between the Father and the Son. And we have access. How do we get into this? What is the access for us? The access is by faith. Folks, the whole thing now is based upon faith versus unbelief. Unbelief is the deadliest sin of all. The devil pushes, works. To push people into this place of unbelief. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. He gives us a new heart. He says, this is the covenant promise out of Ezekiel. I'll give you a new heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you. But the thing that you and I have to beware of is unbelief. The mother of all Sin, as I've heard Pastor David and Pastor Carter and Pastor Teresa preach for years. Unbelief now becomes the nemesis that comes to fight against the body of Christ. That unbelief. Turn with me and I'm going to close on these scriptures. Give them to you just to chew on in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. If there's one thing that, that I fear, it's this unbelief that sets in. Look at verse 12. Verse 11 says, So I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. This is talking about those in the wilderness. Now, Notice the writer is talking to believers. He says, take heed, brethren. Take heed, brethren. He's not talking to unbelievers, yeah? He's talking to Christians. He says, you need to take heed. You need to watch. There's something that you need to give close attention to. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. He calls, the writer calls unbelief. An evil heart. He calls it something that will begin to erode. All that God has given. So it's this faith that God says will take you in. Unbelief will take you out. He says here, this evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. We see that in the church today. It's, it could be based on any kind of issues. But the real issue is unbelief. And then he goes on to say, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So the, the, the deceitfulness of sin, not only ultimately does it separate you from God, but the deceitfulness of sin is that it begins to harden your heart. So 
in, in the past, in just using our illustration of marriage, in the past, uh, if we had some level of intense fellowship, it wasn't really sin. We'd just walk on. Uh, we didn't, I didn't sin against God. We just yelled at each other. We're just not speaking for the rest of the day. It's, uh, you know, she's punishing me. I'm punishing her. And it's, it, there's nothing, you know, too deep about this at all. But, folks... The Bible says the deceitfulness of sin is this, that when you allow anything to persist in your heart, it begins to harden your heart. And in that hardening of the heart, unbelief is beginning to set itself at work. And it's that hardening of the heart where unbelief begins to work that causes you to depart. Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But it's this departing from God. How does one depart from God? How, does one, how do you see somebody praising God today and, and, and months later they're not walking with God? What has happened? It's been that there's been something that has got in that now has begun to harden. And see, the devil is going after one thing and one thing only, to move you into unbelief, to get you to a place where you don't believe that God has paid it all for you, that you are free, that you've got free access into his presence. So when you stumble and fall, he's not casting you out. You just say, God, forgive me. And he says, you've got access into my presence. So now I guard very closely that if any unbelief, I mean, any times of intense fellowship that happens, we go quickly and say, forgive us. Why? We keep the heart soft because it's the soft heart that faith loves and lives in. Faith thrives on a softened heart. God says, I'm taking out the stony heart. I'm putting a heart of flesh in. Why? Because you can then believe everything I'm telling you. And so now we guard the heart from any unbelief. And this is the most amazing thing that God has given to us. This opportunity that any single one of you in this audience today, you say, well, I haven't prayed enough. I haven't fasted enough. I want to tell you today, God has opened the way for you into the presence of God any time, any moment, any place through Jesus Christ. The covenant was with him and the Father and the Son. I access it by faith. He lives in me and he confirms it. I get up and I didn't read my Bible this morning because I was so tired and I feel condemned. And God comes and says, there's no good days and bad days with me. I've done it all. Just come and enter into my presence. I love the testimony Pastor called the other day. He gets up 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock or 2 o'clock and he goes down to his living room. I love that testimony. Well, I'm going to go read. I'm going to go study. I'm going to go get a word for Sunday. And he just flops in the chair and he just sits down and God shows up and just says, I'm just... Just, they don't even talk to each other for a whole hour, yet he is satiated with the presence of God. It's covenant. Brings you into that relationship with God. And there is, as he says, rest for your soul. Amen? Does this make sense today? The covenant wasn't made with you. It was made with the Father and the Son. And you enter into it through faith in Jesus Christ. Give God thanks this afternoon. Father, I pray that this would put so much hope into us that anywhere we go, any place that you may send us, any person, anyone at any time, male, female, Jew, Gentile, young, old, educated, uneducated, anybody anywhere can come into your presence and you can send them to the farthest corners of the earth and they will always have the confidence, God is with me. Lord, thank you for Greenock. I pray that this city be turned upside down for God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pastor Neil. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Neil. And just for the sake of those who might have this question, in their minds and you wonder, well, how does the Holy Spirit fit into all of this? The covenant, who's, who's obviously the third person of God, the Trinity. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the way that the, 
the um, Puritans taught it. <clears throat> they, they taught the doctrine of state and standing. Um, that <clears throat> our standing in Christ is that we're fully received because of our faith in Christ with God the Father. We sit at the right hand of Almighty God in Christ. We are already there in Christ. He is the head, we are the body. You cannot detach the head from the body. If you do, there's no life. I liken it to a runner in a race. I don't know if you've ever seen the Olympic races where they, they come to the finish line and they jut their head over the line. Well, the head, the head coming over the line first, you've won the race, even though the body is still coming through. When Jesus Christ raised from the dead and ascended to his father, the head had come through the finish line. That's why Paul knew we were more than conquerors. That's why Paul could say, I, I am seated in heavenly places in Christ. I, I view my personal life from heaven downward, not from earth upward. I'm already in Christ at the right hand of God, looking back at my life. And the Father says, now, son, you're going to have to go through the fire and the flood, and there's going to be trials and difficult times, but you're already here in Christ. You're already seated in Christ in heavenly places. Thank God for that understanding. That's my, that's my standing. That's where I am. I'm in Christ. I am in Christ today. And I, but the other part of me lives on terra firma. I live here on planet Earth, just like you do. And that's my state. God comes to me because of Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit and literally takes up residence inside my body. I have the God who created the universe living inside of my body, and so do you. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit in Genesis had moved upon the face of the water, and God said, let there be light. That same Spirit is living inside of me and inside of you. That's the third person of God. Lives inside, not a concept of God, not an idea about God, but God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The third person of God lives inside of me, and he is all my life. So I'm up here in Christ, okay? So keep your focus there for a moment. But I live down here. So God comes to me in the person of the Holy Spirit, indwells me, and all of my life, all of my life, he's leading me into truth, he's comforting me, and he's lifting my state in line with my standing all of my life. That's why Paul could say, I've not achieved, I've not arrived at the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, but I, I do forget those things that are behind and I do press on to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I can't be condemned because if I have a bad day, my righteousness is not in my works anymore. As Pastor Neil was saying, the Old, the Old Testament covenant was a covenant that God made with man and nobody could keep. Not only 10 commandments, 606 laws that you had to keep. And if you broke one law, you had to go get a lamb or a, a goat or a dove if you were poor. You had to go to the temple, give it to the priest. He'd cut its throat. They say that, historians say there was a river of blood flowed out of the temple. And can you imagine that? You, you, you've, you've thought a bad thought, and then so you go get yourself a goat. You go in and you give it to the priest. And how far do you think you'd get from the temple before you have to go get another goat? I don't know about you, Pastor I'd just be going to the goat market nonstop. And then there comes a point where you just can't do it anymore. And so what happens? You develop a hypocritical system of religion that ultimately hates God. It wasn't the Romans that crucified Christ. It was the religion that crucified Christ. It was man trying to be godly in his own strength. Ends up hating God in the, in the process. But the Holy Spirit is given to us constantly lifting my state in line with my standing. That's the way the Puritan writers taught it. And that was correct, actually. That's the way it is. So I can't be condemned because I'm not presenting to God my own righteousness. It's not, God doesn't accept me because I've had a good day or a bad day. If I, if I have a heart that is honest. Now, now this, this truth is, is, doesn't apply to the religious game player. Nothing really does of this. It applies to the honest heart. You might have a struggling life, but you have an honest heart. If you can honestly say, I'm an honest Christian. I, I really have given my life to Christ. I really do want to walk with God. Everything applies to you. Whether you have struggles in your life, good day, bad day, you just keep moving forward. The, the righteousness that God has given to you gives you the right to contempt, condemn every tongue that rises against you in judgment. You are now free from condemnation. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you, if you, if you make a choice to walk away from God, your conscience will condemn you for sure. God will do everything to get you back in line with his truth. And that's, that's also the work of the Holy Spirit. But I'm talking, I, I believe I've been an honest Christian all of my life. I've, I've wanted to say, I, I don't really get this other argument sometimes of, of, you know, the person that backslides for 20 years and goes, I, I don't even go there because in my mind, I, I've never wanted to go there from the time I came to Christ. Have I always walked it right? No. Did I ever get mad? Absolutely. Have I ever done things that I... 
that God could have judged me for? Absolutely. I shook my fist at God one time. I was so mad. I thought he had betrayed me. But it's the Holy Spirit given to us, lifting us, guiding us. The covenant that God made with man in the Old Testament was a you do, I do, and we couldn't do it. And so in the New Testament, it's you believe, I will do. That's why it's good news. We, the new covenant is my faith. It's a finished work on the cross. And God just says, you believe, you believe. See, that makes it level ground. That's why, that's why the leper was pressing through the religious crowd and, and the woman with the issue of blood and everybody else and just touched the blind man is crying out. And all these lame people are going into the kingdom of God. And the Pharisees scratching their scritchy little beards with their briefcases full of words. And they had no idea what was going on. Because they were holding to their own righteousness. We pray, we fast, we go to church, you know. How is it possible that these, these, uh, these young ones coming in are, are just, just going so deep, so far, so fast in God. And, and with all our knowledge and all our understanding, we're left standing here with just a pile of religion. And ultimately hating God in our hearts. Because it's the lame who take the prey, according to Isaiah. And that's my hope. It's the lame who take the prey. That's why when, when I see 11 men the first night in this hall standing here, you might see a drug addict. I don't see a drug addict. You might see a guy half drunk in a t-shirt that says, let's party. I see a great evangelist in the kingdom of God. I see men and women who can lay hold of this covenant and begin to understand it's, it's not to the strong, this, it's not to the physically strong in themselves this victory. It's to, the, it's to the heart that's got faith in God that this victory is won. It's to the person who just says, I'll go. Wherever you send me, I'll go. What you call me to do, I'll do it, oh God. What you say is possible, I believe it's possible, God, I'll do this. And you find yourself in, in, in line with one of the most incredible covenants in all of time and eternity. That God would come and dwell with man. It's so simple that the religious mind can't lay hold of it. We bypass it with all our theology and all our, our knowledge and all our doctrines. And we, we it's, it's, it's like... I don't know, there's nothing that compares to it in the world, really. Nothing. I, I, it's the ultimate stupidity, for lack of a better way of saying it. It's like taking a can of paint and painting your own face instead of the house. You, you just don't get the concept. You miss it. It's so simple. It's so simple. And when you and I have finally lay hold of it, when I come to Christ, I am completely received by God. I am a son. Wouldn't it be embarrassing to have a child that's always coming into your presence, trying to, and it's your, your, this is your child. And you're either the father or mother of this child, and this child's coming in every day, oh, I'm not your son, oh, I'm not your daughter. You know, you, for goodness sakes, are you an idiot? You'd look at them and say, what's wrong with you? You're my son, you're my daughter. Oh, well, I thought a bad thought today. No, oh, I, I didn't pray long enough this morning. I didn't take out the garbage. I'm no longer your son. You know, you just, I'd take that kid to a psychiatrist. I'd do something with that kid. You get through their head that they were, they were born into my family. This is my son. You're not my son because you've had a good day or a bad day. You're my son. This is, a, this, is a, this is a blood relationship. Do you understand? It's not broken because you've had a bad day or because you don't feel good about yourself and you know, we, we get this idea in our mind that God became a man, came down to the earth, went to a cross, went back to heaven just to point at us and find faults in us. Insane. Absolutely insane. I hope this really... Now, Pastor Neil's tried to encapsulate in just, in just a few minutes what it really took us five years to fully understand. And... But if you can just let the seed of it get into your heart today. It's absolutely nothing new. It's just what's old coming out of the treasury and made clear again. It's the cross. It's, it's salvation. It's good news. No wonder it was good news to this, this early church. They're striving and struggling and praying and always condemned. Never free, never clean, never at rest. Pushing, 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 pushing. And only the strong could get through. And so all of the poor and everyone else are marginalized to the sides of the temple and the religiously proud rise. And there's a tear system arises in the, in the religious practice of the day. And it's so offensive to that when a lame man is leaping in the house of God. They're so offended by it. 
Amazing, isn't it? That we can actually get to the point where a new sinner would actually stand up and dance and we'd be offended. Somebody has just escaped hell and is going to heaven and we're all in a knot because they're dancing in the house of God. Ah, uh, we think that's just the Pharisees in the old, and it doesn't, don't we, don't we? Eh? I'll bet you there's a lot of that in Greenock. Eh? I'll bet you if I danced in your church, some of you here, you'd be all, in the, ooh, what are we going to do? How do we explain this? This never happens. Nobody ever gets excited about God in this place. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to laugh at yourself. That's a good way to get out of the box. You just got to laugh and say, oh, wow. Oh, wow, I see it, God. Please help me. Please help me. I do hope you've enjoyed the day today. And I hope we've been able to impart something to you and to help you and encourage you on the journey as you have to us just by enduring us and being here. I think it's encouraged us. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock. Bring a friend, will you? Somebody, just find some derelict on the street tonight and bring them to the house. Bring them to this place. It's, it's the house of God because we're here. Just bring somebody to church tonight. Father, just thank you, Lord, for this wonderful teaching that Pastor Neil did today, Lord, on covenant. Thank you, God. Lord, we've only scratched the surface of an incredible gold mine. I pray, Lord, that it would cause people here to go deeper, dig deeper into this truth and to be able to bring this freedom to their people. Lord, you've, you've talked to us today about leaving. <laughs> people who don't know Christ here tonight, Father, and pray, God, that you break whatever barrier it is that holds them back, Lord. God, allow the people to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you to break the deadlock, Lord, and seems to be holding so many back from that final commitment to the life and the grace of God, perhaps because they don't understand it, Lord, or they've had some wrong teaching on it, Father. I pray, God Almighty, that you break this wide open tonight, O oh Lord. Jesus, break it wide open, O oh God. Open the floodgates and let them come in, O oh God. Father, we stand against every power of evil that would try to stop anyone. We say, Satan, just as Moses stood before Pharaoh, we say to you, you must let the people go. You must let the young go, the old go. They're all going. We're asking for the souls of men and women and children in the town of Greenock and the surrounding counties. We're asking for a mighty and a glorious visitation of the Spirit of God, a mighty revival, Lord. God, we believe today, we're standing as ministers and pastors and leaders, we believe, God, that what, whatever we ask for, you'll give us, Lord. We stand between life and death, O oh God, and we ask you, Lord, to stay the plague of death in Greenock. Stay the suicide, stay the abortion, stay, God, the depression, the alcohol, the violence, O oh God, the drug addiction. 
God, the despair, the loneliness, everything, God, that is stopping men and women, oh God, in their tracks from knowing the life that they, they've been given in Christ. Father, I pray, God Almighty, in Christ's name, Lord, that this stop, Lord, there'd be a great, great ingathering of the lost, a great touch from heaven, Father, visit the borders of this town. Father, we pray that abandoned churches be occupied again, that people, that, Lord, there be construction projects and painting going on as people rebuild the physical temple, as the spiritual temple is rising again, oh God. Oh, Jesus, fill the existing churches in this town, God, with your glory. Every denomination, every pastor, God, let a new touch of God come into every church, Lord. Let songs, oh God, be sung from the depths of their heart, whether the new choruses or old-fashioned hymns, it doesn't matter. Let it come from the heart, oh God. We ask for you to bless every church, every minister, God, wherever there's somebody that is seeking truth. If there's only a spark left in the heart, stir it, oh Holy Spirit of Almighty God. Stir that spark, oh God, into a flame again. Father, we thank you for this, Lord. We're not praying in vain today, God. We're praying to the God who hears and knows. We're at the throne of God by invitation. We stand as your sons and daughters, and we're saying, Father, would you consider, Lord, the threatenings of darkness in this town, the God who made heaven and earth and redeemed us by his own blood. Would you shake the places where we're gathered, O oh God? Would you fill us again with the Holy Spirit, God? Would you let us preach your word with boldness again in this generation? Would you deliver us, God, from all of the thievery, Lord, that's come into your house to steal the truth of Christ from us, O oh God? Would you set us free, Lord, from all of these things, O oh God? We stand before your throne today, God. We stand pleading, Lord, for this generation. Don't let these children go to hell, God, when we still have a voice to speak for heaven, Lord. God, break the bands of hell. Break the gates of hell. Break the darkness of hell, O oh God. Break the plans of hell. Break the power of hell, O oh God. Let the glory of our Christ, O oh God. Let the glory of the Lord come to this town, O oh God. Let even today as we pray, this moment as we pray, God, come here. All that's needed in Greenock is your presence. Nothing but your presence is needed here, Lord. Lord, there's not a man alive that can resist the glory of God. Oh, Jesus, the Christ of God. All the darkness of the night has passed away. It is morning in my heart. I am living in the sunlight of the day. It is morning in my heart.